the days of peril, with so much fighting throughout the world. In Asia, the stability is threatened, especially by clashes between the Hindus and the Muslims over Kashmir. In Africa, there is also much fighting among the nations, but the Sudan government has gone to the extent to try to eliminate the Christians and the animists. And in Israel, the Muslims and the Jews are the antagonists. And on our own land, there's a new kind of fighting when fanatics relished the killing of almost 3,000 innocent civilians. President Bush reacted to war against these terrorists. But unfortunately, this kind of a war may be protracted for a number of years, which you may follow with vested interest, as after graduation, you also may become involved. And I hope not. Civilians are targeted for death is a reminder of the policy of the elimination of special groups and people regarded as a possible future threat to the Nazis. And I stress at this time that the Holocaust was not only a Jewish problem. It included other religious groups and people considered enemies of the state. It is true that six million Jews were killed simply because they were Jews, but in the process, between five to six million Christians were also killed. Dr. Johannes Neuhausler, after his liberation from the Dachau camp, became the auxiliary bishop of Munich. He reported the treatment of Father Franz Seitz, the first priest to be incarcerated at Dachau. He was beaten and kicked as he was led by a burly Nazi guard who shouted, here <coughs> is the first pig of the old Reich. And after the war, it will be the chief priest, and thus the end of a Catholic religion. The predominant Protestants were lulled into complacency as they believed that they would be permitted to enjoy religious freedom, but soon learned otherwise when their leaders of the first confessional church also became prisoners in concentration camps. Pastor Niemöller, a leader of the First Confessional Church, after his liberation from Dachau, lamented, in effect, when they came for the Jews, no one cared. When they came for the Catholics, no one paid any attention. And when they came for the Protestants, there was no one left to help. I was a member of General George Patton's Third Army. In our fast dash across France into Germany, we saw plenty of action, and we saw many a death. And one would imagine that we should have been hardened, or at least accustomed, to the sight of death. But this was not so when we entered the order of concentration camp, the first to be liberated by American soldiers. We were stunned. How could any human beings treat other human beings in such fashion? The first scene to greet our eyes was a group of men lying on the ground, some naked, 
others in tattered clothing. All were dead. They had been shot by the Nazis. And when I asked a survivor what had happened in this case, I was told that when the Germans learned the Americans were approaching, they ordered all of the inmates out of the barracks to get ready for a forced march. He asked one of the guards for permission to go to the toilet, which was granted. And when he came out, seeing no one about, he hid under a pile of rags. And soon thereafter, the Nazi guard came in for the final inspection. He looked around and then walked out and the survivor heard the shots. And of course, you saw the scene. A little further down, we saw another group of men. They are also on the ground. And they are also dead. Because they had been killed by the Nazis. They had rushed out of the barracks, assuming that they were going to be participating in a forced march. But as soon as they got into the courtyard, they were shot. Now there is a scene that I can't show you. And that was in a small building, which was so dark that my camera couldn't take the picture. But inside, there was a large group of dead, naked, emaciated bodies piled one on top of the other, just like cordwood, with lines spread in between. And I can assure you that we are happy to get out of that building. And when we got outside nearby, we saw another group. These naked, emaciated bodies were placed in a symmetrical fashion. And I'd like you to note that aside each body, there was a stick. And on each stick, there was a number. For these men had long lost their names, and their identification was only by means of a number. They had been ready for the crematorium, but the arrival of the Americans had stopped that action. Now we thought we had seen enough of these gruesome scenes, but there was more to come. In the rear of the camp, the Nazis had dug a pit. They surrounded it with steel rails, and into this pit, they threw the naked dead bodies in the effort to hide the evidence of their misdeeds. And what we saw were the remains of burnt bodies, burnt bones, and burnt flesh. It truly was very gruesome. If any of you have the opportunity to visit Washington, I would recommend that you visit the U.S. Holocaust Museum. After you enter the museum, take the elevator, go up to the fourth floor and turn left. You'll see a wall-sized picture similar to the one which I have just shown you. Then later, our outfit was stationed across the main entrance to the Dachau concentration camp, which had been liberated by the Seventh Army. And opposite us was the Iron Gate, upon which was the inscription, Arbeit macht frei. 
Work will make you free. Now what a sardonic joke that was. Because the only freedom for so many of the prisoners would be on a pile of ashes by way of the crematorium. And speaking of the crematorium, perhaps you'd like to see what one of the ovens looked like. We saw four. This was a final resting place for so many of the prisoners, people who died of starvation, being overworked, or shot. Now here was an ironic twist of fate. Later, at the Nuremberg trials, where Nazis were tried for crimes against humanity. The suicide gearing and 11 Nazis who were tried and convicted and later executed, their bodies were sent to the Dachau concentration camp where they were dumped into the very same ovens which they had built for their victims. Now at the camp, I had the opportunity to interview a number of the survivors. There's one whom I interviewed not at the camp, but actually right here in Scranton after I came home from the war, for he was a Scrantonian. He was a member of the United States Air Force flying over Germany his plane was shot down. He was captured, sent to a prisoner's of war camp, and transferred to another prisoner's of war camp, and finally to Dachau, which was not a prisoner of war camp. And when I asked him what he was doing there, he told me that his job was to take the dead from the gas chamber and take them over to the crematorium and dump them in the ovens. But in the process, he was to examine the bodies. And if there was a ring on the finger, break the finger and take off the ring to look in the mouth. And if there are any gold fillings, break the teeth and take out the gold fillings and to look in the private parts for any hidden jewels. And when I asked him, how could you do such terrible things? Well, with a tear in his voice, he exclaimed, gee, I was only a kid of 19, and they scared the hell out of me. They told me that if I wouldn't do it, they would throw me into the ovens. And until this day, he's still suffering from post-World War II syndrome. I did have the occasion to interview a father and a son. This is a picture taken at the railway station at the Dachau camp. I was amazed to see a little boy still alive in such a camp because generally his destination would have been to a death camp because he was of no use to the Nazis. Now, the father told me a rather bizarre story. As a matter of fact, it was pretty hard to believe. He told me that when his wife, his son, and he were being rounded up for transport, fearful that if the wife and the son would be together, the both would be killed. So he put the little boy in a knapsack to keep with him, and they both were sent to a concentration camp, and later to the Buchenwald concentration camp. Now he being the youngest at the camp, became known as the Benjamin of Buchenwald. Now Benjamin is a Jewish word for Benjamin. You may recall that the youngest son of the patriarch Jacob was named Benjamin, 
So in the number of Jewish families, the youngest son is called the Benjamin of the family. Now here you see him in a uniform. As a matter of fact, he was put on the rolls as an adult in this camp. And the reason for that, I was told, was that his father was an accomplished leather craftsman. Now at that time, the Nazis had lost a lot of tanks, trucks, they were low on fuel, and so they had to resort to horse-drawn artillery. And the father, being a leather craftsman, was in great demand to make harnesses for the horses. And so the deal was made that the little boy would be put on the rolls if he would be a good workman for the Nazis. Now, I did have his and many other pictures in a number of museums throughout the world. And on a number of occasions, I would be asked, what was his real name? Was he still alive? Where did he live? What did he do? And I was curious also. And so I wrote to a group of survivors in New York seeking his whereabouts. But the response that I got was that they had no record of him. Well, about four years ago, a group from New York went to the Jewish War Veterans Museum in Washington, and one man walked over to the picture of this little boy and said, I know that boy. And the curator got very excited, rushed over to him, and he learned the name of the Benjamin of Buchenwald, where he lived, and even got his telephone number. And so he called him up, and he did get his permission and did get his say-so that he would come and view the exhibit in Washington. And then later he called me up and said, how would you like to meet the Benjamin of Buchenwald again, except today he's a man? And I said, of course I would. And so my wife and I, we made a special trip to Washington and we did meet at the U.S. Holocaust Museum. Now, as it happened, I did know a volunteer at the museum, and she persuaded the guard to permit us to stay after the others had departed so that we could get down to the second floor to witness the audio video of people who had been liberated from concentration camps. Now, he's in the center, I'm at the right, and the curator of the Jewish war veterans is at the left. But if you'll notice, he is looking down at a picture on the video. This happened to be a little boy who had been liberated. And as it happened, that little boy was he. a long moment of silence because he had many things to think about. And of course, we respected his silence. And then the next day, we met again, and this time at the Jewish War Veterans Museum. Now, he asked me more questions than I asked him because being a little boy, he didn't know what his father and I were talking about. But I did have to ask him one question, and that was, was it true that your father put you in that knapsack? And his answer was, yes, it was true. Well, we found out that his name was Joseph Schleifstein. He lived in New York. He worked for AT&T and was pensioned, and now was a communication consultant. I can assure you that my wife and I consider that a most memorable occasion, that trip to Washington, when we met again with the Benjamin of Buchenwald. 
Now after the war in Europe, there was much confusion in Germany. Germans were now the refugees in their own land. They were fleeing from the Russian soldiers to come to the American zone. And in the American zone, where many of their homes were destroyed or occupied, they meandered in all directions, trying to find refuge. Now in Munich, I saw civilians trudging along, some holding their belongings in hand, others keep keeping them on their heads. And there were some fortunate ones who were able to ride carts that were being pulled by a cow. Then there were the liberated Danes whose blonde hair had turned a garish yellow from working in a munition factory and they were heading west to their own homeland. But the Russian prisoner of war was stranded. He did not know where to go, for he had heard the rumor that Stalin had declared that the Russian prisoners of war were traitors. And if they set foot on Russian soil, they were to be shot. Now the other prisoners in concentration camps had been liberated, but actually, they were not free. Most were still in camps, guarded not by Nazi soldiers, but by American guards, because there was no place to go. There were quota restrictions in the Western world that prevented the immigration to lands of freedom, and the British blockade kept the Jewish victims from landing in Palestine. And actually, there was an army order of non-fraternization with civilians, and that did include the camp prisoners. I learned that there was a camp for the displaced persons, which they were now known as on the outskirts of Munich. So I decided that I would bend the rule a little bit and go visit this camp and to see what was going on. And when I came into the camp, a crowd surged forward and surrounded me. Now what did they want? They wanted me to contact their relatives or friends in the outside world to let them know that they were still alive, where they were, and that they needed help. And I said, okay, and I took down names and addresses, and I did make contacts for quite a number of them. But there are some cases where one man would come over and say, I've got a brother in New York, and I'd write down his name, and I'd say, and what is the address? New York. You know, most of these people came from little villages and where everybody knew everybody, and they thought that the mere fact that he was in New York, that everybody would know him. So I had to explain to them that that would be a little bit more difficult. And so I did make contact with two Jewish publications, The Forward and The Day. They would print the name of the displaced person who was seeking either the friend or the relative and would appreciate them contacting the newspaper. And when that had been done, the newspaper would send me the name and I would give this to the displaced person. And thereafter, I became the liaison between the displaced person and his friend and his relative in the outside world. I was amazed at the general attitudes of the former prisoners who were now the displaced persons. To me, they appeared to be stoic. They did not go about lamenting the treatment by their oppressors, 
or that they wanted to seek revenge for the horrible Nazi crimes. Their primary interest was to leave Germany to go to a land of freedom. So why do we still talk about the Holocaust that happened more than 50 years ago? Because we should always remember the fate of almost 12 million victims of the Nazi Holocaust, and that a hate campaign can affect everyone, whether it's school children shooting other school children, racists shooting people of color, the burning of churches and synagogues, and especially the thousands of hate groups that are now on the internet. Now, all of these should teach us to be alert to the lesson that we should be tolerant and also respect one another. And especially to remember that just because one looks different, speaks differently, thinks differently, is no good reason he or she should be subjected to hate or to discrimination. I will now entertain questions or comments. I'll give you a couple of seconds to think about it. Well, in general, if anyone has questions about Mr. Plotkin's wartime experiences. Yes, sir? Did you ever come across, um, like once you're moving into Germany, any actual like Nazi prisoners of war? Did they have any kind of, um, did you see like what they were like at all or any kind of uh, like remorse or anything? Well, actually, uh, I did see quite a number of, of uh, prisoners of war. Not that I captured them, it was more or less that they surrendered because I was a cryptographer in message center and that was the closest installation to, to the road. So that when they'd want to come to our installation, they generally would have to go past our installation first. And we had cases where I can recall where one dozen of them, at least a dozen of them, came forward and they had the white banner. And that white banner was on a pole and it happened to be a pair of white longies. And it took me some time to have them to stop and then after that, then I took them over to the sergeant, and uh, they were sent to a, uh, a prisoners of war camp. Now, in one of the camps, now we didn't see any, any uh, guards alive at the camps because as soon as they learned that we were coming, they ran away. But we did see one guard. As a matter of fact, in camp there was someone in civilian clothes lying on the ground and he was dead. And when I asked the survivor what happened here, and they told me that he was a Nazi guard. And when he heard that the Americans were coming, that he ran away like the others, he discarded his uniform, put on civilian clothes, and he had the gumption to come back to the camp to serve as a guard for the, a guide for the American soldiers. But he was recognized by some of the inmates and they killed him with a three-legged stool. And while we were there, we could still see him on the ground with the blood still oozing from his head. And by the way, that was the only Nazi guard we saw in a camp. But we did see quite a number of them because after the war, we had a couple of uh, Nazi soldiers, prisoners of war, in our camp doing KP duty and uh, we had relationships with them in time. Yes? How long were you in Germany after the war ended? Did you stay a while? Or? No, uh, you know, the war ended uh, in May, and uh, I left the following January. Yes? Oh, sir, did you get a sense that the, the Nazis lost their will to fight, in a sense? No, except that one of the prisoners of war who was doing KP duty for us 
he was a man probably in his 50s. And of course, at that time, we thought he was an old man. <laughs> and uh, he was lamenting the fact that he had a son who, happened, who was at Stalingrad. And if you remember, the, the Germans took a beating at Stalingrad, and he was afraid of the for the safety of his son. Can you explain what KP duty is? KP duty? KP, well, it's the abbreviation for kitchen police. That means you, you clean the pots and the pans. <laughs> Yes? Uh, did, did you find the Battle of Normandy? Not, not on the scene, but the Third Army was activated. Yeah, well, yes, we, we fought there, but uh, I wasn't there on D-Day. Kind of, yeah. But um, do you know about the, the Fallis Gap? Yeah, well, that's when there's a lot of fighting there. Yeah. Was that Patton's fault or Montgomery's fault? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it was either. I don't think it was either's fault. It was the fact that the Germans were fighting fiercely, and it was more or less of a retreat action. You know, they—they they, at the beginning they didn't give up immediately. Over a period of time, though, we were chasing them. But of course, there was a little bit of animosity between the two. I'll tell you a little story that uh, might be of interest to you. We were during the Battle of the Mets, I got up one day and, and all of a sudden I saw we were surrounded by a lot of our tanks. Well, I asked, what are they doing here? And the answer was no gas. Actually, it was a serious situation. So Patton went to the installation, talked to the colonel in charge, that we needed some gas. And the colonel told him, I'm sorry, but uh, we have a requisition. We've got to send it up north to Montgomery. So Patton said, uh, what is your rank? Colonel, what's my rank? General. <laughs> well, in Patton's language, which I don't like to repeat, he <laughs> that gas. <laughs> You got it. <laughs> yes? Were you in other theaters of the war besides uh, France? Well, we were in France and Germany. Okay, but you weren't like in Sicily or Italy or North Africa? No, that, uh, we, came, we came later. Although Patton was, Patton was in Sicily at one time. Yes? A lot of stories about Patton, like, uh, most of them true. Like you were like standing like in the middle of the road and should have played this pistol and stuff. Well, he, I saw him two times. Now this one time, we were supporting this 26th division that was a New England outfit, and uh, we are supposed to go south. By the way, we were artillery supporting the infantry. We were going south, and then after that, we were supposed to go east. Well, we went south all right, but then all of a sudden, we weren't going east. And I recall standing on a curb there, and along comes Patton. And for some reason or the other, I guess he didn't like to sit. He was standing with an extended lower jaw. And you can actually see his pearl-handled revolvers. And I turned to my buddy. And I said, I bet you they moved tomorrow. They did. <laughs> yes? The boy that hit him in Aztec, did he understand what was going on in the camp of the child? Did he know? Did he understand fully like, what the Nazis were doing and everything? Did he know what was going on in his the child? Well, It might have been a little play for him, but uh, you may be interested to know that recently there were some articles in, in the uh, New York papers about him. Uh, you know, a couple of years ago there was a film, a 
Life is Beautiful was an Italian film that uh, won an Oscar. And this is a, a movie in which there's a father and a son were in a concentration camp. And the father tried to make the son believe that they're playing a game and that the prize would be a tank. And actually, at the end, when the American tanks came in, he thought that that was going to be his. But anyway, they compared him to this little boy. And that got quite a play in some of the New York papers. But uh, he showed me how he, he would advance on the roll call and uh, he'd take three steps forward and then give a salute to the commandant and then retreat. And uh, apparently uh, he wasn't harmed because he was alive. Yes? Do you know how the Americans um, ended up in Dachau? Uh, the Americans? No, the American, like the from Scranton, Scantonia. That was a prisoner of war. Well, he was sent there as a prisoner of war. Was it a mistake or was it intentional? No, that's that's what he was. As a matter of fact, uh, while I was there, naturally, we, we walked around and take a look at the place, and there was one place there where the ground was still red, because that was a place where they shot their prisoners. And by the way, you're. Russian prisoners of war were bait because quite a number of them were killed, you know, instead of being treated as a prisoner of war. Are the Americans do with all the bodies? Were they buried afterwards? Because there's just bodies everywhere. How do you even start? Well, the Americans did some, but the German civilians did a lot. Because I have pictures at home where we have some of the civilians were digging graves, mass graves, and that's how they get rid of the bodies. And uh, that, that man now, but the little boy, what happened to his mother? Well, they all came to the States. They, they became reunited. My first inkling that uh, things weren't going right was we came to a town there and we saw a graveyard where the, which had been desecrated, where some of the tombstones were broken in half and toppled. And uh, at that time, we had a 10 minute break, that means we stopped. And uh, a man came over and he told me that he had been one of the prisoners in the concentration camp and he had escaped. And uh, he was telling me that things are tough. Not, not that there are any killings, he wasn't from a death camp. Because you know, your death camps were mostly in Eastern Europe, mostly in Poland. Although they did have crematoria in uh, other camps, in in Germany and uh, some of the other countries. Just curious, Mr. we hear a lot from people like uh, my own family uh, that they really weren't aware of what was going on. Maybe because you were young, but yet in 1942 and 43 and 44, the New York Times was already reporting this. Millions killed. So you have uh, like a dissonance between what people could see on the paper and what they actually knew, what they internalized. Do you have any thoughts about that? Well, actually, uh, your death camps were established mostly after '42. Yeah, but I'm saying when the time, by the time you were already in Germany, the news was already out. People knew about uh, if you the New York Times that was already reporting. The only trouble is we didn't get to the New York Times over <laughs> <laughs>
way when we got into the camp, but actually you were stunned. And uh, it meant that after we got out of that camp that we would fight all the harder to win. resentment from the other guys about being in the third army and things like that. So I know a lot of a lot of the people who was in the first army and the seventh army they were jealous of the third army because I guess because Patton. No, actually uh, your your soldiers aren't jealous. You might be able, they might tease you a little bit. But uh, I don't think there was any animosity actually there between the third or the first army. As a matter of fact, uh, you have some outfits coming up, a green outfit. I remember we had, we were supporting a uh, division, and they had another uh, place to go, and another green division came in, and all of a sudden we we're hearing a lot of firing. What's going on? What's going on? And then when the report came back, it says, oh, they're only practicing. And we said, oh, we're, we're at the front here. But, I mean, those are those are some of the things that happen. But uh, actually, I don't think there's there would be any animosity. There might be animosity among the heads, like between Patton and Montgomery, but uh, <laughs> I would say that's about that didn't pertain to us. Okay, we'll see one last final question. Uh, we're certainly thankful again 